going on, everybody? Josh Wilson, and this is the Big Dog Podcast. In the studio, Jonathan Mack. What's going on, Jonathan? What up, what up? You missed me last week? Yeah. Always? Always. <laughs> always. Was in Dallas for a couple of days. Always a great time with the with the fam out there. Man, it was crazy. Um, real quick story about that trip, and then I want to jump in to share a couple of thoughts of the book I'm reading with everybody. Um, so, you know, I joined this group two years ago in March, Apex, and um, it's high level business networking group, um, CEO, you know, C level type execs, um, businesses ranging from, you know, low seven figures to billions. Uh, it, it's crazy with a B, it's billions with a big B. Uh, so there's some real serious folks in that room. Um, and then my clown ass in that room, but you know, it is what it is. Try to add some value. Um, but it's great. And you know, I, I had certain expectations from the group and, and what it may provide, what I may be able to provide, um, uh, opportunities, um, things I can, I can learn, uh, things that I can share in return. Uh, what I did not expect out of this group <laughs> was the spiritual aspect of it. And, you know, and how God comes in and, and plays in, in these meetings and presence in the space. And we had a speaker come in um, and it just, it just was dope. We have actually talked to him and I'm, I'll save the name. I'm going to hope to have him on the show here in the next couple months. But at any rate, long story short, hundred plus people end up out in the hallway, you know, kind of circled up around and they were probably... I don't know the exact number, 40 plus people accepted Jesus, like at this business meeting, um, you know, in Dallas at the Marriott. Um, it was wild. It was wild. It just blew my mind. It was such a powerful um, moment and um, opportunity and, th and thing to be a part of. It was just cool to see people take that next step um, in their personal spiritual journey. It was just really cool to see. And that's the one thing that is con a consistent tone, um, you know, through Apex and through these meetings and and through the involvement that I never would have expected, but has been a huge uh, player, you know, in this group. And I think in the success of this group and the people in this group uh, is that spiritual aspect. It's been really, really cool. And it freaking blew my mind. Um when that many people accepted an invitation to to accept Christ into their life. So really cool. Congrats to all my brothers and sisters who uh, were a part of that last week. And I'm excited for you. You know, your life is just beginning and it, it's going to be um, to be a great, great time. So that was cool to be a part of. Got back late Friday night. Flights were a complete train wreck. I ended up landing in Norfolk, I think like 315 in the morning. I was supposed to be in my bed by like 1215. Landed in Norfolk like 3.15, got home around 4. Full time, I'm sitting there. Like, how much are private planes really? Just trying to figure out. <laughs> I was so pissed. Uh, turns out, very expensive, Jonathan, in case you were ever wondering. Um, we had this conversation back with, when yeah. I was an intern. If yeah, you don't yeah. If you don't remember I that. I don't. Yeah, because you asked yourself this question like three, four years ago. Yes. They're still really expensive. Yeah. I thought the numbers might hit different, you know, three or four years from the conversation if I was thinking about it before it it doesn't um it's still a really ginormous number I believe that's entitled <laughs> inflation <laughs> I don't know I don't know man it, it well maybe plus with everybody and you know whatever people getting kind of germaphobic and whatnot a lot of people have started flying private who do have the means to do it so it, demand has gone up availability has gone down and so what happens to pricing? Boom, pricing's going to go up. But if you've got a handful of people that you're flying with, honestly, it, it's not that big of a big of a gap. I mean, I've seen a lot of people that I don't trust with a car getting their pilot's license as well, getting those real small, like, two, <laughs> two to four-seater type yeah, planes. that ain't for me. Somebody, our boy Sean, he's working on his pilot license. He's been doing it for years. He's only got probably... I don't know, hundred so hours left to get his license. He sends me videos of him taking off and landing, like in Fredericksburg. And I'm like, 
Yeah, I don't know about that, buddy. Yeah, I like to eat whatever I want. I only laugh in the face of God so many times. <laughs> I just can't see it. Look, he I was talking to Sean about the plane thing, and he said to me, he goes, no, man, the planes are super safe. He goes, there's lots of safety protocols in place, you know, all these things. I'm like, that's great. He goes, man, check this out. If I was going to get a plane, this is the plane I would get. And Sean said, he sent me a link, and the plane had a built-in parachute. I'm like, hold up. My confidence in you as a pilot, I didn't say this to him, but I will. he's going to hear this, but, but my thought immediately goes to, if you're the pilot who wants to buy the plane with a parachute, you've got some questions in your head and some con- concerns about execution. I'm opting out because the planes I fly on don't have parachutes as far as I know. I don't think they have f- parachutes on 737s. You know what I mean? No. We're dropping like a rock. I would imagine. Maybe not. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. Did I tell you about the time? We're flying out to, um, I think we're flying to California, and I'm sitting there watching plane crash videos. I'm in an aisle seat. Devin's like, <laughs> Devin's like, what are you, what are you watching? So I'm watching. I'm trying to look at the safety ratings. I want to see how they handle like failure in the air, and what happens. It, more times than not, they land the Joker, and it's fine. Yeah, but that's the type of research that gets you on several lists. Uh, oh shit! I didn't. Even- <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, I never even thought about that. Yeah, I didn't think about how to pl- crash a plane. I was just watching That's plane like engine failures. You know, I feel like you're doing even more advanced research than the people that have taken oh, over planes shit. in the past. Come on, okay, damn it, I don't want to be on a list. I don't want to be on a list. All right, take it back. I'll delete my history. But I wasn't looking good for those purposes. I just wanted to see because I want to be confident. I fly a lot more than I ever have right now, and I want to know that you know these guys and women because when i get on the plane now the pilots always used to look old to me and i'm like man i want to get the wings they're gonna give me the wings i'm getting on the airplane well now at 42 almost 43 i'm getting on the plane i was like you look to be the same age as my son who's been driving for a year yeah i mean that's it's concerning that reminds me of a joke that i've heard that says you better eat right and take care of your body now because your future doctor's probably cheating his way through medical school (laughs) Yeah, I mean, you're not wrong. I don't trust nobody younger than me doing anything that has my life in oh, their hands. Oh, gosh. Well, at a certain point, buddy, all those people are or will be. So I think that's where I'm getting. But anyway, it, Dallas was a great trip. Flights were um, they were smooth, but, man, did we did we get delayed. Um, but, you know, made it back to the family safely and, and all is well. So hope everybody out, you know, all of our listeners, all you guys out there are having a great start to the year. What's today, the 12th? Yes, sir. Yeah, this is day 12 of 75 hard. You guys learned about that last week, and I'm rocking and rolling, doing all right. Yeah, for those of us who really want to start, this is still day zero of 75 hard, but we're getting <laughs> after it eventually. I, yeah, you know, I, it's starting to get in that routine. The first 15 days are typically the toughest, starting to feel good. Um, you know, so it's, it's a process, and, uh, you know, just one day at a time working on it so all is well but look guys uh so part of 75 hard we talked about last week is reading you got to read that 10 pages a day and and as you guys know i'm always reading something i'm i'm a reader but typically i'm the one reading multiple books at one time because i can't just stay dialed in and um get through one book much like like when we get in here you know the conversation sometime will bounce from a topic to a topic and that's just how i'm wired and if that drives you crazy I wouldn't keep listening because this is how it's always going to be. Um, but one of the books that's in the stack right now that I'm working on uh, reading through is The Subtle Art of Not Giving a f-. All right. The Subtle Art of Not Giving a f-. And the title captured me and, you know, got me really interested in it. And so grabbed it, started to check it out and reading through it. I'm like, what is this thing about? Um, because when I think of someone not giving a f- I think about someone who is indifferent. And as I started through the book, it's really starting to change kind of my uh, perception of the statement and someone who really lives their life that way. So the title, The Subtle subtle Art of Not Giving a a Counterintuitive Approach to Living a Good Life. And again, that caught me. That's what drew me in was that title. So whether it was Mark Manson who came up with the title or someone on his team helping, you know, great job on that because it worked. So what I wanted to talk about are three subtleties of not giving a 
that he talks about early on in the book to kind of set up the book itself. So let me hit you guys with these. Um, subtlety number one, not giving a does not mean being indifferent. It means being comfortable with being different. And I was like, oh, shit. Like, I get that. That's legit. Let's be clear. There's absolutely nothing admirable or confident about indifference, which I totally agree with. People who are indifferent are lame and scared. They're couch potatoes and internet trolls. In fact, indifferent people often attempt to be indifferent because in reality, they give way too many <laughs> And I'm like, okay, this is pretty interesting. Subtlety number one, not giving a does not mean being indifferent. It means being comfortable with being different. All right. So, Jonathan, you know, when you hear about someone who doesn't give a for me, I just said, you know, I felt like that's a person who's indifferent. Do you feel that way? Did you Was that kind of your thought process? Or hearing kind of subtlety number one, was that more in alignment with how your thoughts were with it? I mean, I think the indifference, like the word itself, and I mean, I don't want to get into semantics, but sure. indifference is kind of like not really choosing between caring and not caring. Sure. And to me, not giving a f would be not caring at all. So I just kind of struggle to see where indifference plays into that. But I could see mm. the perception of like, yeah, being indifferent could be perceived as that. Yep. Okay, cool. One of the things he starts talking about also is um, adversity. And, you know, people get real upset about it or frustrated about it. One of the examples he gives is, you know, being at a grocery store and you watch an older lady screaming at the cashier, berating him for not accepting an expired 30 cent coupon, right? And like the whole, the whole world right then, that lady's whole world is factored in and driven by the fact that some 17 year old cashier won't accept an expired 30 cent coupon, right? And so it's this huge, huge scene that's taking place. And, you know, the question he goes is, why does this lady give a you know, and subtlety number two, to not give a fuck about adversity, you must first give a fuck about something more important than adversity. So for me, that dropped in really and spoke really clearly right now as I'm going through the 75 hard piece or any challenges, really. If you, in order to not care about adversity, in order to not care about challenges or difficult times or roadblocks or barriers, you have to give more about something else right so for me as i'm going through the 75 hard process like we talked about in the last episode i believe for me as i stated going through this process is going to enable me to have increased odds of obtaining what my objectives are for 2022 that's what we talked about so is this a pain in the ass yes 75 hard is a pain in the ass i'm going out to a dinner a monthly dinner katie and i have we're not supposed to talk about work. We just go out. We go to the same place every month, same day. And we had that dinner tonight. And when we go out, we start with cocktails. We start with an app. Are you going to Wands? No. Ah. No. We like Wands, though, a lot. But no, we it's Schlesinger's in Newport News. That's like our, our spot. Love Mul to go to. Multiple homies work there. Oh, really? Yep. All right. Is your homie DD? Like the waiter? The waitress, yeah. Uh, waitress, nah. No? Nah. You guys are cooking? Uh, I have one friend that's a cook and two that are waiters. Okay. All right. So Dee Dee is our lady. She serves us every time we go in. You know, we always request her if we're going in there. But at any rate, when we go in, Katie and I have a really great time. And there's cocktails. There's wine. You know, we'll get dessert. You know, the, the food is delicious. Um, you know, they take great care of us. It's a great experience. And Katie and I butt heads a lot. And this is, you know, one time a month that we try to go and just enjoy each other's company, honor our friendship. Um, and we're not supposed to talk business, but we end up talking business all the time. Well, I pop in this morning and I was like, man, all right. So I thought about what I'm going to order tonight because my order is going to look a little bit different. Trying to be strategic, made a commitment to, to people getting my health in order and getting some weight off. Um, and I'll actually share that with everybody at the end because I've made a commitment, and so now I can have more people hold me accountable if I verbalize it to the air. So, um, you know, we're going. I was like, all right, 
I guess instead of that 20 ounce bone in filet, I'm going to get that six ounce filet. Instead of fries, I'm going to get some sweet potatoes. I'll get the salad. I won't get onion rings. No dessert. And I'm not drinking. 75 hearts, no alcohol. So there's no wine. There's no cocktails. There's no nothing. And that's fine. That's no big deal. It's just going to be a very different experience. I feel like I need to call ahead and prep Dee Dee because she's going to be shook when we come in and it's not our normal deal. She's going to think the the world's ending. She's going to think the business is tanking, um, all these things. And so there's going to be thought process. The manager's going to come over. Why aren't you spending the money you normally spend? What's going on? I don't give a about that, what they think and what they feel about it, simply because I'm more focused and dialed in on what matters more to me, which is the goals I have, the objectives I'm trying to achieve. Um, and so there's adversity. This is going to be a tough, this is my first real test in 12 days. This is my first real test where I'm putting myself in an environment where habitually I do certain things and I have to do the exact opposite of all those things tonight in order to stay on track with my goal. It's a little stressful, but I'm not worried about failing because I care more about the objective than I do the adversity. Does that make sense? So when he talked about this subtlety number two, to not give a about adversity, you must first give a about something more important than adversity. That made a lot of sense to me. I felt that. Um, it's any challenge in life that comes about. Um, you know, I remember when we were in college, freshman year, Devin's up at JMU. I'm down here working. I'd go up to visit her any chance that I could. But I had enough money to get there and gas. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. I don't know. It was always close, but I wanted to go up and visit her. I wanted to go see her. We'd sit in traffic forever. I'd run into this in the middle of the night. I'm driving after work, one thing after another. None of it mattered to me. The, the, the roadblocks, the barriers were small. I didn't care about those things because what I cared about was getting to her and seeing her. And so if you find yourself having a tough time with adversity and when, when things pop up that are challenging to you in your life, I think it's really important that you figure out what does that matter anyway? Like if you always find yourself stalling out when adversity hits, you're not really working towards anything greater. That's why you fail when the smallest in uh, the smallest. I don't know. What's the word I'm looking for? Um, inconvenience, irritation, inconvenience, inconvenience, irritation comes up. You just fail. Like, ah, uh, well, there's traffic on 64. I guess I won't make it to Williamsburg today. Whoa, what, what were you going to Williamsburg for, right? You have to scale. And if you're the type of person and you're listening that fails every time there's a minor inconvenience, that's ridiculous. You're never going to accomplish anything because nothing worth having is easy. Nothing, everything's going to take work. And you have to be focused on that in order to be able to deal about the adversity. So I don't give a f about these little inconveniences because I'm so focused and I give so many f's about my objectives and goals tracking with that Jonathan that makes sense 100% the third and final subtlety they talks about is whether you realize it or not you are always choosing what to give a f about and it says you know he talks about people are not or aren't just born not giving a f in fact we're born giving way too many f and he talks about, have you ever watched a kid cry his eyes out because his hat is the wrong shade of blue, right? I mean, we've all, we've all done that as, as a child over some absurdity. Um, I've seen my, my nieces, my nephews, hell, my kids. You hand them the wrong pacifier when they were babies. Well, they didn't want that one. Bro, it's the same damn thing. It's just a different color. And they're going to throw an absolute fit and cry and, and, and lose their mind. You know, or they wanted a different cup. I don't care what cup it is. I mean, I kind of care what cup it is, but most of the time I don't care what cup it is. I care about what's in the cup. Does that deliver it to me? I've drank some pretty nice beverages, some pretty expensive stuff out of a red solo cup, and I've enjoyed it just as much as if I was drinking it out of the finest crystal. It doesn't matter. I, I want the contents. I'm not worried about the vehicle. You know what I mean? Um, 
And so, you know, when, when we're young, he talks about everything is new and exciting. Everything seems to matter so much. Therefore, we give tons of f- about everything and everyone and what they say about us, um, whether that girl or that boy called us back, uh, whether that business meeting went, went, went well, whether they took the, took the meeting or not. Um, gosh, people care whether their socks match or not what color the birthday balloons are. These are examples that he's throwing out there. And he goes on to talk about, like, as you get older with maturity, you get more, I don't know, choosy on what deserves the f***s that you're going to give. And you should, because it, it doesn't matter. I mean, we, we go through that process, and you're, you're caring about the things that matter that serve you, that serve you, not opinions of others uh, or comments of others or decisions of others that have no bearing on your journey and your path and what you're going to achieve. And so it it's maturity. So it's not that you don't give a I don't give a That guy had zero given. Maybe in that, that's, that's something you'll see, you know, online and whatnot. And and yeah, sure, people will say that. And maybe with regards to that, there's zero f-ks given. But the reality is everybody gives a f-. But you really just have to get it dialed in to where you're okay only giving a f- about the things that actually matter in your life and serve you, serve your objectives, and serve those that you care about. There is no time. You don't have enough energy in a day, I, you don't have enough energy in your life to waste a single f- on anything that's irrelevant. And if you concern yourself with everybody else's stuff, Karen, Donna, Diane, who else we got? Who else on online gives a f- about everybody's business? We got Karen, we got Donna, we got Diane's. I didn't know Donna and Diane were were uh, options. Uh, oh, just- bro, those are definitely options. Give me two more. You know somebody. Uh, I really you just, don't. I really still <laughs> just call them Karen. Karen. Everybody's Karen. Look, they spend their whole life exuding so many f-ks. They've got no energy for anything else that would actually improve their lives. That would actually help them. We saw some yesterday. Katie comes to my office and says, "Hey, just a heads up. Somebody posted looking for a dog trainer." you know, on a, a local uh, Facebook group, community page. Um, and, you know, they're making recommendations and somebody who's not connected to, to us at all that really is irrelevant comes on and says, whatever you do, don't use so-and-so, so-and-so. so-and-so. I'm like, okay. Like, I don't care. I'm like, why, why does this person even care about us at all? Like, I almost felt bad, almost felt bad. Like why, what you have nothing else going on in your life that you got to concern yourself to jumping in on some random person's Facebook post, looking for a dog trainer. You're just rolling Facebook and social media, looking for opportunities to, to complain. Well, I mean, a lot of people have been given a uh, moral validation and it's like a so- sense of uh, social currency. Oh. Yeah, to, no, you're to, right. to just go and like look and seek out stuff like that. But yep. for me, I judge pretty much every situation like day to day based on how much effort do I yeah. have to give this situation. People f-ed up when they started teaching, uh, treating Facebook as a personal referral, a personal recommendation from a friend, you know, and it's like so and so said something. This is this is gold. This is if my mother told me. You know, this this is gold. No, this is some random ass person. You have no clue of their truth. You have no clue of their experiences. You know, nothing. And that goes for good or bad. You yeah. know, it's like, oh, so-and-so did this. I'm like, all right. It, it's just a funny, funny thing to me how much weight people will put into that. It's also just funny because social media has become pretty much like your ID at this point Uh when you're online and a lot of people will just blatantly expose their gaps in knowledge. Yes. And then when this happens, they're just kind of like, Oh my bad. I'll just delete it. (laughs) Like nobody, like nobody saw that. Yeah. My favorite thing to do. And this is where I really 
appreciate um, well, well, one well run groups. All right. Um, or pages, depending on the, the platform. You know, everybody who gets on these things agree to certain rules most of the time and things that they will do. And the ones that when people actually get out of line, you know, and you mention it to the people who own the page or on the page, whatever, you know, they'll remove that crap and, and change it. Um, the pages, and I respect those people, you know, and I don't care whether something good said about me or one of my businesses or bad. If it's legit, I want it to be there. Um, but if it's BS and it's against policies, I want it to be handled. Um, but a lot of these groups have just become uh, fest. And people go on and they just love it and they feed it. And, it, and, you know, when you look at these groups, the activity going on within it goes against everything that it says it's about and supposed to be about. But, well, we don't want to silence them. We don't want to avoid you know, you, you love the BS. You love the negativity. And they're just, they become cesspools for all that crap. And so that... That to me are, are the people that are are wasting. They're wasting away their lives. I mean, no one's guaranteed any time. I'm not guaranteed I get home tonight. You know, none of us are. And I just think about, you know, <laughs> you know, get to heaven and I'm sitting there. We're going through my list of deeds, and you know, it's like, well, I spent you know 17 hours a day on, you know. Yorktown 411 <laughs> Facebook page trolling and just being negative and bitching and moaning and all that. I, it's I mean, tough. Really what it is when it comes down to it is an inflated sense of self-importance because what most people are afraid mm -hmm. to admit is that most people don't know who you are or care about what your opinion on a lot of things is. And that that's the same for every single one of us. Yeah. So. When you go and you complain on these pages, it's because you're looking for that, hey, look, here's what I did. Right. I'm creating. I've never done anything to to make my voice matter. Here I can make my voice matter I mean, it, in their own mind. Yeah, I mean, the Internet isn't real. It's just not real. It's not a real place. I push back on that a little bit. Um I think that I think that it's I think that's a very real place. I think though that you have to do your own personal due diligence to decipher what is real and what isn't. All right. And so cause I think like for our businesses, the internet it creates very much community and um a ton of value and a ton of representation and we're able to to put a whole lot out there and gain a whole lot back. But that doesn't mean that everything that's out there is truth, right? It's factual. There's plenty of BS, but I, I would, I would stand by that. We absolutely have real community through the internet. I, th I think that communities can be formed and the value is certainly there, but, uh, the importance that people place on it, because I don't think that anything is truly real that could be shut off if you just avert your attention from it. You know, if you shut, you, fair. you shut your phone off and you turn away, what, what matters at the end of the day is the tangible real things that we're doing as, a, as a business. Cause you, yep. everybody could lose internet connection tomorrow. And there's still thousands of people in the Hampton roads areas that know we do a solid job. Cause oh, for in sure. Person. Yes. 100%. So that's what I mean when I say like the internet isn't real because nothing sure. is real that you can just shut off. Well, I'll tell you, there's a lot of real businesses that the internet got shut off that would not exist if that happened. You know what I mean? And I mean, they're very real, very real businesses, very real people. Now, our business, I agree with you. Yes, we are very connected locally in real life, tangible. You can touch it, feel it, whatever. I mean, that's what we do, right? We can't do what we do if we don't have a leash in our hand with a, a dog. Um, but how we market, how we advertise, what we do. And honestly, over the last couple of years, we, to your point, we've backed off a lot of social media from an activity standpoint and advertising and marketing because we're so busy with clients that are coming in from referrals and, and things like that. I, I'll forget to put, and it's, it's shitty. We'd do way better if I was more consistent on social. But 
it's become a lesser priority to me and to us as an organization as we've grown, whereas in the beginning it was super, super important. So I don't know. You, you kind of challenged my mind with that statement a little bit. I got to think about that a little bit. Yeah, because, I mean, it's all, a, it's all a spectrum, right? Like it's real and it's not real. There is value and there isn't value. It's yeah. all what you, what you get out of it. I wouldn't mind just turning off all the Karens. Wouldn't bother me either. No, you do a good job separating from all that mess, though. Like it, at some point, at some Devin doesn't believe me, Katie doesn't believe me, but at some point, I, I see a time, like I see it in my mind, where I don't have this. I don't want, and that's not because I've got a chip in me, and I can just talk into my wrist, and you know that does the deal. Like I don't want the connection. I can. I, I'm believing in my life at one point, I'll be able to pay somebody to have this and they'll be with me when I need, you know what I mean? And we can just roll from there. You want to put money on it? Uh-huh. <laughs> at some point, you know, at some point, at some point, I don't want to put money on it, but it's, it. yeah, it's a big deal. You got to be able to separate. You got to have those connections. Um, and I think the bigger the bigger piece is being able to decipher between what is what is real or not, and whether that's online, whether that's in your relationships in in physical form at work. How many people we know go home from work and start complaining and bitching about people they work with? Right, that's a big deal. You're not gonna love everybody you work with, particularly if you're in a large organization. But why? What changes can you make? Put your energy towards controlling what you can control and put your energy towards what changes you can make for yourself. Cause at the end of the day, that's all you can control that eliminate the people that are stressors. Any energy you're putting into complaining to your spouse about Brenda at work. There's another one, Brenda, that one typically pops up. Uh, Brenda at work. That's not going to fix anything. It's really not going to fix anything. Uh, one of the things that's big for us here and I'll wrap up with this and I think really, really plays into the subtle art of not giving a is, you know, if somebody has a problem with something, we teach this, and this is something I learned from Stu Hodges, who was episode one, um, you know, gosh, at this point, probably 12 years ago, um, you know, if you've got a problem with something within your organization, you've got a problem with, with leadership or, or, you know, whether it's top of the top or your direct report, you know, who you report to, if you have a problem with them, you need to have that conversation with them. And if you did and, and you're not feeling better about it or feel like you're making progress, then we need to, to go above them and have a conversation. When you just start complaining and talking about people who are at your level or below, these people aren't authorized or equipped to fix the problem at all. That's just gossip. And I am big on uh, anti-gossip. I, I hate gossip. I don't want it. And because when you're doing that, a small problem festers and just grows and grows and grows. And then all of a sudden it becomes this huge tipping point. And the people oftentimes in this scenario that could have addressed it or fixed it never even knew there was a problem. Yeah. And I mean, my big thing is that I can't remember who said it, but it's a really important quote to me is you tell one person you're looking for advice. You tell two people you're looking for solace. You tell three people you're complaining. Yeah. So it's like, go address the problem. Right. Just have the conversation. And it, it here's, here's what I can promise you. It's going to be fixed. It may not be fixed in the manner of what you want it to be, but if it's such a, a, a disconnect between you and that individual or, or there's a, a moral failure on their part or, or something along those lines, it's going to be fixed because it's either an unknown problem that, you are right in and they're going to work to to make it right and handle the situation or they're going to confirm to you based on their actions and words that yeah the thing that you don't like is reality it isn't going anywhere well the problem's still fixed because now you can start working on steps you need to make to either remove yourself from that scenario that's not healthy for you um you know exactly where you're at when you're just having these conversations, you are, you're just complaining and it, it, it dilutes the validity of your issue when you're gossiping more than you're putting energy into, to handling the problem, you know, so come in with full weight, let that conversation take place early on before everybody's pent up emotions get involved. It works out great. And now you're spending more time giving a 
talk about the things that serve you rather than things that distract you. So that's what I got. Mark uh, Manson, The Subtle Art of give, Not Giving a f- Um It's a great book. You can pick it up on Amazon. If you've read it, man, comment. Let us know your thoughts on the book. Um, if you haven't read it, you know, but you're interested in the book, shoot us an email, bigdogpodcast at joshwilson.dog, or hit me in the DMs, and the first three people that do will get a book sent out to you to send your address. And But like, I want to give less f- um, on things that don't matter. And we'll go ahead and get that book sent out to you. All right, we love you, and we'll see you next time.